Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have a, an amazing uh, speaker today, uh, Gopal Sharat Chandra, who will be uh, discussing today interactive dashboard of geographic mortgage data analysis. I'm very happy that uh, Sharad is one of our speakers today. He has, I've personally worked with him uh, through the admissions process, and I'm glad to see that he's able to come back and give back to our uh, our alumni as well as to potential students. So we're in for a treat today. So before we get started, I did want to cover some information with about the academy. Um, first and foremost, I'm just going to present my screen very quickly. One second. Okay, so can everyone see this? We should be good to go. Yes, we're able to see it. Better present. Wonderful. So as I mentioned, welcome to today's event. Um, before we did get started, I want to just present some housekeeping uh, rules. Make sure for anyone who is interested in asking questions, um, comments, Definitely, please be sure to have uh, utilize our chat and our Q and A button towards the bottom of the of the screen. You know, we want to make sure as we're going along, if something has happened or if you missed something, um, or if there's any questions regarding today's um, discussion, we'd be more than happy to address all your questions. And very importantly, make sure that you have it set to all panelists and attendees. Therefore, that we be able to view your question and make sure that we can provide a response to everyone as well. Uh, with that being said, a little bit about our school. Uh, New York City is a data science boot camp. Is New York City Data Science Academy offers both boot camps and professional development courses. Uh, very excited to announce that we launched our data analytics boot camp recently. Uh, for those who are interested in pursuing that as well, uh, that goes along with our data science with machine learning. So that's very uh, very exciting news to be able to provide to all of our uh, potential students. Additionally, NYC DSA is the only bootcamp teaching both Python and R. Um, and a lot of students uh, do appreciate the fact that we do offer four industry standard projects. So as you're moving along your training, you are building a professional portfolio to enhance or create um, a transition or present new uh, potential professional opportunities. Uh, we have over 2,000 alumni uh, working across the globe, and we offer we're, uh, relationships of 500 plus uh, professional relationships that you can tap into working with our career services department. Um, as always, very proud to announce that uh, we've been rated the best data science bootcamp and best online data science bootcamp by SwitchUp over the last five years running and uh, the last two years running. So for those who are interested in the upcoming cohorts, we are offering um, on, on site and remote live. So our in-person classes have resumed, our doors have opened, uh, which began on July 6th for the summer cohort, and we will continue to offer those courses um, for the fall classes. So for anyone who's interested in returning to our campus, and um, pursuing uh, training in our data science uh, with machine learning bootcamp, uh, please feel free to submit an application. Um, again, that will begin on September 27th. Additionally, we are going to be offering um, a second online program, um, cohort, sorry, and that'll be our full-time and part-time online bootcamp, which will take place on August 16th, and there will also be a September 27th start. Uh, additionally, for our data analytics online bootcamp, that will take place on August 16th. So just some context behind them all, our on-site and remote live bootcamp runs for 12 weeks. That is a full-time um, program, traditionally Monday to Friday. That is a full-time uh, bootcamp experience. For anyone who's interested in the full-time online, that is a 16-week program, and our part-time online bootcamp is a 24 week program and our data analytics online bootcamp is a 12 week self paced program. So for those who have interested in any of the programs 
programs that I've just discussed or even some of professional development courses, um, please feel free to reach out at admissions at nycdatascience.com. But if you're at a point where you're ready to submit an application, uh, the admissions process is very simple. Uh, you simply go on our site and you submit an application. You will receive uh, some follow-up steps to book your interview. Once you've booked your interview, uh, you will receive a technical assessment. The technical assessment is designed to gauge both your technical and analytical skill. And once you've completed that and returned it, you will receive a response uh, and some uh, possible next steps regarding your application. So the process is very seamless. And as you're moving along, you'll have your admissions advisor helping you step by step to make sure that we get you to where you want to be. And that's enrolled into the data science bootcamp. For those who are interested as well, for the upcoming online August 16th course, we still are offering a 10% discount. So you'll receive a, a $1,760 discount off your tuition. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. For anyone who is interested, as I mentioned, that is a great opportunity. Again, if you do have any questions, so if you want to, if you want, if you'd like to book some time uh, to speak to an advisor, you can always send an email to admissions at nycdatascience.com. I'll be available throughout this webinar to answer any admissions related questions. Uh, but if any, anyone has any questions after that on next steps or even discussing or wanting to book an info call, you can always send an email to admissions at nycdatascience.com and we, we will be happy to connect with you. Okay. So as I mentioned, you have a great speaker today and I will now turn it over to Sharat. Thank you, Noe. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, so uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Gopal Sharachandra. I go by Sharat, the first part of my last name. Um, um, Noe was just mentioning about the, the remote live bootcamp. I'm uh, part of the uh, boot camp number 25. Uh, we're actually in week 11 of the 12 week uh, boot camp. Um, what, what I'm going to present to you is uh, one of the four projects uh, that Noe was referring to. And uh, this project was actually done during week five uh, of our boot camp. Um, the uh, the uh, title of this project, Geographic Mortgage Data Analysis. So, um, the uh, the objective is really to to uh, to look at mortgage originations um, during 2020 and to see uh, to analyze patterns uh, and to do it geographically and and what I picked for geography was just the top 20 metros. Now again, uh, uh, I think the key part here is how do you define metros and. I define these as combined statistical areas or CSAs, and I'll actually talk about all of this in, in some level of detail. Um, the purpose of this analysis, I think uh, many of you can uh, understand or relate to it. It can help improve the understanding of the demand for different types of mortgages and also the credit risk and how these vary across geographies. Um, I think we all know that over the last year, there's been a, a, a big increase in demand for houses. Um, there's a number of people who are seem to be freed from the constraints of uh, needing to be close to their workplace or looking to move more uh, into the suburbs or further away from the cities and uh, buying houses. So that's we're seeing a lot of that. That's driving the demand for purchase of houses. The second thing that has happened over the last year is uh, the Fed has dropped interest rates almost to zero. Uh, which has caused a corresponding drop in mortgage rates. And that has spurred a huge uh, increase in refinancing. And refinancing essentially means you pay off your old mortgage by taking out a new mortgage. So that's also caused a big increase in mortgages being originated. Okay, So uh, essentially 2020 is, is a big year for mortgages. And uh, you'll see this on the next slide. Um, if you look at the bottom uh, um, graph. Sorry to interrupt. I, I think you're not sharing your screen. Oh, uh, sorry about that. Let me. Uh, 
ओके ठीक है था यस नाइस कैन यू सी इट यस ओके थैंक थैंक्स मार्टिना नो वरी थैंक यू शर्ट नो नो प्रॉब्लम टॉप um so if you look at this graph and uh, let me know if, uh, let me try and make this a little bigger so you can all see it uh, even more clearly this is just a graph of mortgage originations from over the last 20 years and you can see 2020 is the biggest year and by the way 2021 is also a huge year so uh, um, at least so far you know now there is some indications it's starting to level off but you know it might be too early to say um so you can see that there was a huge increase in uh, um you know uh, uh, demand for mortgages and so 2020 was a huge uh, uh, year for mortgage originations so the question is why use freddie mac data to uh, to understand the picture of the whole well last year freddie mac and fannie mae accounted for 60% of the mortgages that's the gray portion of this bar and freddie and fannie are roughly comparable fannie is a little bit bigger than freddie so uh, you can view it as a reasonable proxy for the market so that's that's the reason why i picked freddie mac data but i should also mention that uh, fannie mae also pro- uh, produces uh, loan level data um and uh, uh, one can also use fannie mae data for this purpose and one can frankly combine the two as well okay uh okay um, i'm going to take a, a couple of minutes and talk about some of these uh, geographical units uh, because uh, a lot of the analysis makes use of them so i'm going to talk about what's known as uh, a cbsa a core based statistical area which is made up of two kinds of areas msa uh, metropolitan statistical area and micropolitan statistical areas i think many of you have probably heard the term msa metropolitan statistical area um that's that term is still used and that was the original term but um, about uh, you know 10 15 years ago the omb the office of management and budget which which is part of the white house essentially defined um, a grouping known as a cbsa or a core based statistical area which is made up of one or more counties and the definition is uh, uh, by the way the link is uh, here and i've just pasted the definition um so a cbsa can be made up of either an msa or a mu sa mu is a greek letter typically used for micro so it stands for a micropolitan statistical area okay uh in both cases there is an urban core okay so a metropolitan statistical area has an urbanized core of 50000 or more plus adjacent territory that has a high degree of social and economic integration with the core as measured by commuting tax so what this means is you have one or more core urban areas with surrounding areas with people commuting to to the core commuting back and forth okay so that's an msa a mu sa is similar the only difference is the size of the core is smaller it's 10000 to 50000 and by the way i just wanted to let people know that there is a proposal currently put out by the omb to increase the 50000 to 100000 but that's not been approved yet so it's still a proposal okay so the between the msas and the mu sas that accounts for about 94% of the us population so 85% are in msas 9% are in mu sas and the remaining 6% are really in rural areas that fall outside of the cbsas okay um hopefully that's clear by the way uh, you know uh, we can uh, you know if you have questions please raise your hand at any point okay um let's go to the next slide which is a csa which is a combined statistical area a csa is really a collection of adjacent msas and mu sas okay so it's uh, it's a set of uh, uh, adjacent metropolitan micropolitan statistical areas that are called a combined statistical area it can be characterized as representing larger regions that reflect broader social and economic interactions such as wholesaling commodity distribution and weekend recreation activities 
and are likely to be of considerable interest to regional authorities and the private sector. Okay, so this is uh, this is the uh, definition of a CSA. A CSA is so it's a larger grouping. In fact, let me um, I'm going to uh, show you this. Uh, Just uh, okay. So this is uh, this is a list of uh, micropolitan areas. So, but this is from Wikipedia. So uh, the link is there. You can see that there are micropolitan areas. Some of them you may have heard of, like Concord, New Hampshire, uh, or Muskegon, Michigan, and uh, the the sizes are bigger than fifty thousand because it includes uh, not only the core but also the areas around them. Um, the uh, the CSA, the Combined Statistical Area. Okay, there are one seventy five total uh, actually, and um, the biggest is New York. And New York uh, includes uh, a whole bunch of areas around New York. The second biggest is Los Angeles. Then you have Washington. Washington also includes Baltimore. Then you have Chicago. Then San Francisco and San Jose together are considered a CSA. Okay, so hopefully uh, this uh, you get the picture that this is a pretty large, um, uh, you know, grouping. Okay, that's what a CSA is, and that's the level at which were looking to to break out the uh, uh, the the, uh, the total mortgage population by another way of thinking about this is you know just like uh, you can organize the country politically in, you know into states you know we have 50 states this uh, the csas are a way of organizing the country in in sort of economic ways uh, uh, you know these are uh, economic uh, entities um, this map is actually a very useful map, the, the CSA map. Um, so let me show you this. Uh, so, and uh, what you'll see here, uh, so for example, and I hope you can see this, the dark, so this, the New York, uh, um, the New York CSA is over here, okay? And the dark green, is the metropolitan, the MSA, the light green is micropolitan areas that are within the CSA. So you have both the dark green and the light green. And you could see it for some of these uh, uh, CSAs, which are in the Midwest, the, 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 the differentiation between the dark and the light, okay? Uh, or even New York, for example, there is this county in Connecticut, uh, I think it's Torrington, which is uh, part of the New York CSA, uh, but it's it's actually a mu essay. okay? It's light green. Uh, at the same time, there are also MSAs, metropolitan statistical areas, which are outside of the CSA, okay? And those are in the dark beige, and you'll see these in the map, the the dark beige. There are also micropolitan statistical areas outside the CSA. Those are in light beige, and then the very light beige are urban areas. Okay, those are completely outside the CBSAs. So, um, so anyway, ho hopefully this this helps. This map is a uh, is a really cool map. I, I just just wanted to bring this to your attention. And all these links are in the presentation. I assume we are sharing the presentation, uh, right, uh, Martina? So, um, so uh, <clears throat> the uh, the New York uh, CSA you can actually see it on this map. So New York CSA includes obviously New York City, but also Long Island, parts of New Jersey. Um, it includes uh, Connecticut, including New Haven. It goes north, uh, you know, even north of Poughkeepsie, Kingston. It goes west up to East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. Okay, so it's a pretty large uh, CSA, uh, New York. Okay, so. That's a, hopefully that's a little bit of an in introduction to um, the um, the way in which the U.S. is uh, geographically grouped. You know, you have MSAs, MUSAs, and then the grouping of those together is CSAs. Okay.
Um, let's see a chat. Uh, yes, uh, George asked every. Oh no, it's fine. It's fine. I'll take care of it. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So what's the data objective here? Okay, so the data objective is we want to take each loan in the Freddie Mac data set and map it to a CSA. And we just talked about what a CSA is. Okay, and we want to use the geographic information provided in the data set uh, for that purpose. Okay. Um, normally, if we had a five digit zip code, that's actually adequate information. However, Freddie Mac, for privacy reasons, provides only three digit zip codes. And by the way, this is true of Fannie Mae as well. So, um, so, so given that, um, you know, that, that sort of blurs the geography uh, to some extent when you have a three digit zip code, the last two digits are removed. Um, so uh, the good thing is Freddie Mac does make available a column for MSA or a metropolitan division, which is, um, you know, for the larger MSAs, they are divided into smaller units called metropolitan divisions. Normally, uh, I'm sorry, uh, normally uh, uh, it's not good practice to use derived data from a source. Okay? As a data scientist, you want to use data that comes from that source and to derive the data independently. But in this case, because Freddie Mac actually has uh, access to the full five digit zip code, and they, and they use that to derive the MSA and MD field, it's actually useful and valuable to use that MSA MD field, okay? And therefore the approach that I took is to use both the MSA MD field as well as the three digit zip code to derive the CSA, okay? So uh, what other data do I use to derive the CSA? So I use, uh, two uh, sources. One is I go to the HUD, is the Housing and Urban Development Department, and they have these crosswalk files that connect zip codes to CBSs. And uh, let me actually show you that. Um, and these are called the uh, uh, HUD USPS zip code crosswalk files. And if you go below, you can actually get crosswalk files from uh, you know, zip code to CBSA, zip code to CBSA division, which is metropolitan division. They also have other crosswalks like zip code to counties, zip code to CDs, congressional district, even zip code to census tract. Not only that, they also have the reverse. You can also go from a CBSA to a zip code and so on, okay? And uh, you have documentation, you have some data dictionary there, uh, you have an FAQ. So it's all there on the HUD website. Um, so I use the HUD data, but that's not all. Um, um, the, obviously, the HUD data is, uses five-digit zip code, so I had to coarsen that mapping because Freddie Mac has only three-digit zip code. So I changed it to a three-digit mapping, which makes the mapping coarser. Um, the Census Bureau has mapping from CBSA to CSA. Well, again, you can go to the Census Bureau, and they have what are called delineation files that link CBSAs and metropolitan divisions with CSAs. Okay, all right. Now let's let's actually put it all together. So, uh, so, so here's the goal here. Okay. I have Freddie Mac geographic data, which is three digit zip codes. I have metropolitan uh, division, uh, uh, sorry, MSA uh, uh, and metropolitan division data. And it turns out 8% of the data is actually missing in Freddie Mac's uh, data set. My objective is I need to map loans at a loan level. I need to map these to a CSA. And once mapped to a CSA, then I want to pick the top 20 CSAs. So what did I do? Now, in the case where I had an MSA and Metro, I went straight to the Census Bureau because Census Bureau already has a mapping from CBSA to a CSA or a CBSA division to a C CSA. So I essentially uh, joined the two. I had the MSA uh, Metro division, I can use this mapping. So it's a one step mapping. In the case where these were not available, then I went to the three digit zip code 
There I, I used the hard crosswalk file. I went from a zip code to a CBSA, and then from a CBSA to a CSA. So it's a two-step mapping, okay? So in the case of MSA and Metro Division, it's a one-step mapping from zip code to CSA. It's a two-step mapping. Here's the interesting thing. Once I finished the mapping, turns out of the 8% of loans that had missing uh, MSAs, I was actually able to map 6.3% of those to a CSA. Why is that? It's because these loans, even though they are not MSAs, they are actually in a MUSA. And we know that MUSAs can also be part of CSAs. Okay, because CSA is not just a, a collection of MSAs, it's all, it's all of the surrounding areas. It could be a small town where people live and commute to a larger city. And so that's part of the CSA as well. So if a mortgage is from a, a, a MUSA, it wouldn't be counted in Freddie Mac's data set, but I, I pick it up as uh, through through this zip code to CBSA to CSA map. So essentially I ended up with um, closing the gap on 6.3% of the 8%. So the remaining loans are either from USAs that don't fall within a CSA, or it could be from a rural area that's outside of all CBSAs. Hello? Okay. okay. Now, um, okay. now I Mujib just want to mention... Excuse me, uh, Noim, could you put your uh, phone on, I mean, your mic on mute? My apologies. Got it, got it, don't worry. Yeah. Um, so um, the um, there's 5.4% um, the, uh, of loans uh, which have MSAs don't fall within CSUs, okay? So it, that's fine because you saw earlier in one of the map, the map I showed you, the US map, that there are quite a few MSAs which are not part of CSAs. Okay? And I just wanted to mention there's a small number of cases, particularly in the Midwest, where you have some, because of the zip code uh, making it three digits, if you have adjacent CSAs, the, uh, the loan could be in either CSA. And um, in that case, I just picked the first one because I used R, the R function distinct just picks the first one whenever you have, um, whenever you have a conflict. Okay, um, so this is a data set. Um, originations from January 1st to September 30th. It's only fixed, fixed rate mortgages, which is the majority of mortgages. Now Freddie Mac does, has started putting out a data set with adjustable rate mortgages, but, um, but this data set has only fixed rate. Total number of loans, look at the number. It's almost 1.2 million. Okay, just gives you an idea of the volume of mortgage originations last year. Okay, if it's just Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, which together account for 60%, Freddie Mac's maybe a half or a little less than half of that, that itself is 1.2 million, okay? It has 31 columns, a number of attributes. I picked only a subset of them. And then the, the I picked the top 20 metros, not based on population, but based on the number of mortgage loans originated. It generally aligns with the population, but not exactly. And again, the reason I did that is because we're interested in the mortgage activity, okay? And the code can all be found on, the, on, on my GitHub. <clears throat> all right, now let's, uh, let's actually look at some of the uh, results. Um, so um, first I will show you a couple of graphs and then I will uh, show you an R uh, Shiny app. Um, quickly, if you look at, uh, excuse me, a box plot of distribution. This is a FICO distribution of the 1.2 million loans. Um, the median is 771, the mean is 763. There's a slight skew towards uh, lower FICOs. Um, let's see, uh, okay. And um, then um, the LTV distribution is very interesting. And it's, it's, it's a, a very unusual distribution because, you know, essentially, typically you find in box plots, the median is within the box plot. Here is a box plot where the median actually falls outside the box plot. Uh, the median is 73 and you see where uh, the box plot is. And, and that's because there's a huge mass of mortgages who have LTVs between from the high 70s to like the 95 or so. 
And by the way, LTV, I hope everyone knows what, a, what that is. It's loan to value. So if a mortgage has a loan to value of 95, it means if it's a new loan, uh, if it's a purchase, then the borrower has put 5% down. If it's a refinance, it means the borrower has 5% equity. Okay, so that's what, uh, so LTV is loan to value. Uh, what this is saying is that, wow, there's a large number of loans which tend to have high LTVs, but they are being counterbalanced by a large number of loans which have very low LTVs. So, you know, you have like two very um, different populations. You have this population of, of loans which have very high LTVs, and then this other population which have very low LTVs. Um, and, uh, you know, like going into their 20s. Um, and the balance uh, of those gives you a mean and median of uh, in the low 70s. So it's sort of like, you know, I have my right arm extended out very far and my left arm, I'm holding it very close to my body and holding a, a weight in my right arm and a weight in my left arm. That's sort of the, the balance here. It's a, it's a very interesting distribution. And again, it's worth studying more. Uh, DTI, by the way, stands for debt to income ratio. Basically says what portion of your income do you uh, make as debt payments? And this distribution is very symmetric. It's around, I've got a mean and median of 33. Okay. Again, all of this is at the national level. Okay. Um, before I, uh, these are some national level statistics. I won't get into these. We'll talk about those when we go to the individual slides. But one thing I do want to point out is, um, uh, the purchase mortgages, uh, the number of purchase mortgages is the mortgages for which the loan was taken out to purchase the house, okay, as opposed to refinance the house. Okay, so that's roughly about 30% of the total. Okay. All right. Now let's, uh, uh, let's actually look at uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, okay. Oh, people can see this now. Um, so what I'm going to start with is with uh, the FICO distribution. By the way, I hope you can see the top 20 metros. You'll see the, uh, I have a three letter code. I hope everyone can read this. ATL, in many cases, it's the airport code. In some cases, it's not. ATL stands for Atlanta, BOS for Boston, CHI for Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Detroit, Houston, Los Angeles, Miami, Minneapolis, New York City, Orlando, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Portland, Sacramento, Seattle, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Washington. Okay, so these are all the uh, uh, the twin, top twenty metros. And what you see here is a distribution of FICO. So first, I'm going to focus on the risk metrics. So on the risk, uh, the distribution of the risk metrics. So FICO less than or equal to six eighty. Six eighty is generally viewed as a uh, a sort of a boundary between, uh, you know, not so, uh, between good credit and not so good credit. Those people who have FICO scores less than 680 are viewed as not, uh, not having very good credit. Nationally, the, the average is around 4.6%. Uh, um, there is variation in the metros. You can see like uh, Orlando, Detroit, these are the highest, close to 6%. Um, then there's a few more, Atlanta, Dallas, Miami, Phoenix, which are higher, which are in the five. There's essentially, there's two groupings of metros. There are some which are in the, uh, you know, two to 3%, even 4% range. And then there are some which are in the five to 6% range. Okay, so it's, it's just uh, uh, useful to note that there's, there's a separation in the metros. Um, the next one I'm going to uh, look at is also a risk characteristic, which is LTV loan to value. Okay. People look at uh, their loan to value as an indicator of, you know, how much skin in the game do you have? No. And these are uh, loans where the borrower has put less than 5% down. Okay. It's LTV greater than 95. Okay. So less than 5% means like, you know, they put like 3% down or some number like that. Uh, nationally, uh, the Percentage is 6.3%. But again, you see uh, a lot of separation across metros. In fact, majority of the metros are like less than 4%. In fact, uh, the California metro, San Francisco and LA are less than 2%. But there are a couple of metros which stand out. 
Um, and um, this is Minneapolis, Detroit, actually, and Washington too. Three metros stand out, really, in terms of high LTV. And this is LTV greater than 95. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Could you um, make it bigger, like maximize sure. your screen? So. Sure. Is that better? Yes, it's better. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Th thanks, Martina. <laughs> no, no problem at all. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So now the next question is, all right. So we're seeing, um, uh, so someone has asked, what is LTV again? LTV stands for loan to value. Okay. So what is the, the amount of the loan divided by the value of the property? Okay. So an LTV of 95 means um, the property, uh, the loan amount divided by the property is 95%, which essentially if it's a new home, it means you just put 5% down. Okay. Um, so the, the next uh, thing I looked at is, okay, fine. LTV greater than 95, you know, nationally it's at 6.3% and you see the separation across metros. What if I included 95s? Wow. Now the national level jumps to almost 30%. What this is telling us, there's a huge slug of LTVs exactly at 95%. Okay? The number is actually 23.5. So if you want to be precise, but this is saying that roughly a quarter of the borrowers last year, at least the first three quarters of last year, put exactly 5% down on their mortgage. Okay? Um, and again, the, the percentage varies across metros because if you compare it uh, with the previous, uh, one where you know you see um, like Detroit, uh, Minneapolis, they were uh, on the high end. They still are the highest. Um, like so, Detroit has gone up to uh, thirty-eight percent. Um, on the other hand, you have San Francisco, which is uh, in the high teens, and previously it was uh, around uh, five percent or so. So the uh, the uh, uh, the Variation across metros at, at 95 is, is anywhere from 28% in Detroit. Like Detroit was at, uh, at was around 10%, if you look here. And now it's around, uh, if I go to greater than 95, it's at 38%. So it's about a 28% slug at 95. And San Francisco, it's around 15%. So quite a bit of variation across metros. Now, one of the uh, principles of underwriting for mortgages, uh, people who underwrite mortgages, and I'm sure some of you have uh, gone through this, uh, is that uh, the underwriter tries to trade off LTV versus FICO. In other words, if your credit quality is not very good, then the underwriter will require that you make a large down payment, that you have uh, enough skin in the game. So that, which will act as a deterrent to your defaulting. On the other hand, if, if you want to put, make a low down payment, then the underwriter will check to see that you have a good credit uh, uh, rating, like a good FICO score. But, but generally, you don't find underwriters allowing people to have both a low FICO and a high LTV. Okay? That trade-off is... Uh, is not uh, is generally uh, avoided. So what I check for, I check for what is called risk layering, which is what is the percentage of FICO less than 680 and LTV greater than 95 across the top metros. Now nationally, that level is now 1.2%. Uh, okay, um, so there is some um, uh, effect of uh, uh, underwriting here because if they, if LTV and FICO were completely under, uh, uh, you know, um, unrelated. In other words, if, if an underwriter uh, paid no attention to um, uh, LTV uh, and FICO when underwriting, then, you know, if I, I have here the national level for uh, FICO less than 680 is 4.6%. The national level for LTV greater than 95 is around 30%. Then the product of the two should give me the percentage, right? 4.6% times 30% should, 
should be the percentage of risk layering. For you now, if I'm sure some of you have calculators, you can probably do the calculation. I've already done it. 4.6 times 38 is 1.38 percent. But what you actually see is 1.2 percent. Okay, so that tells you that there is some underwriting uh, discipline that has been followed by the underwriters. They are actually limiting the risk layering. Okay, to some extent that has been limited. What is interesting is though is that that the extent to which the risk layering has been limited varies across metros. So for example, take a play as a metro like Denver, the risk layering is around uh, about 25 basis points, maybe a little higher than that, maybe 30 basis points. Whereas if I take the Denver, you know, less than 680 is around uh, 3% and I multiply the greater than 95 for Denver, which is around say 23 per 24%. So that's about 70 basis points. So 70 versus 25 or 30, that's more than half reduction in the uh, risk layering. On the other hand, you take a, a city like uh, Detroit. Uh, Detroit was uh, close to 6%. Um, LTV greater than 95 is 38%. So 38 times six is about 2.28. And if I uh, look at the risk layering, Detroit is at 2%. So 2.28 to 2%, that's maybe about 15% reduction. So, um, and that's a good point. Um, and they, that, that, uh, that uh, I see someone has mentioned Detroit has special incentives and government programs to get people uh, back into homes, and that, that could be a factor as well. So I'm just telling you what the data is uh, showing here. Okay, good. Um, debt to income is, I'm not going to spend time on it. There's very little uh, uh, difference across uh, metros. There's a couple of metros which are higher, but uh, um, let's talk about first time home. This, is, this may be of interest to some of you. What this is saying is that uh, the of the how of the mortgages that were taken out for the purpose of purchasing a home, how many were for buying a home for the first time? Okay. And if you look at that, New York and San Francisco are the highest. New York is at uh, 60%, it's actually 61%. San Francisco is at 59.6, almost 60%. So the two are the highest. This is generally consistent with the media narrative that we've been uh, hearing, okay? That uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, people no longer feel uh, necessary to be tethered to, uh, you know, to being in an apartment within the city close to their place of work. They can move to the suburbs, they can be uh, further away. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that happen in New York and San Francisco in the bigger cities. And so, yeah, 60% of the people who bought homes um, last year were buying it for the first time. And some of these other cities are not far behind. Uh, LA, uh, Seattle, uh, Washington, um, you know, Boston, so on. Okay, so that's first time home. The, the other statistic that may be of interest is second home. Homes. Second homes is what fraction of people who took out a mortgage to buy a home were buying their second home? So this is not their first home. They already live in a house, this is their second house. Okay, and so where, where was this happening the most? Okay, look at the top. And this, this graph is very interesting because there are four metros that are like way ahead, uh, you know, like head and shoulders above the other metros. And because of that, the national average has been pulled up to be higher than all of the metros. So it's very interesting. You have a national average with 16 metros on one side of it and four metros on the other side. So it's a skewed distribution, basically. Okay. So, and where do you see the top two metros? They are Orlando, Miami, Florida, uh, Metro. Okay. Uh, by the way, someone has asked about investment property. Hold, hold your thought on that because the next slide it talks about investment property. Okay. Um, so um, Florida and second homes, again, um, we hear a lot of, um, um, you know, a lot of stories about uh, 
you know, people have second homes in Florida, it could be for two reasons, uh, could more than two reasons, but at least two that we hear. One is people uh, buy second homes in Florida, Florida to live there part of the year. The other is people buy a second home in Florida as a prelude to moving there for retirement. Okay, so, and you see a lot of second home activity in both of the Florida metros. Very interesting is the next two are Phoenix and Sacramento. Uh, and think about the location. Okay? Phoenix is probably driven by activity from Southern California and Sacramento is probably driven by activity from Northern California. Okay? Now it could be for different reasons. Now Sacramento is uh, 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 people uh, wanting uh, a vacation home because Sacramento is close to Lake Tahoe. So it could be for that reason. Um, uh, Phoenix, it could be uh, people either as a vacation home or it could be people who are buying a second home as a prelude to retiring there. But none of the other metros are anywhere close by. The one metro that is uh, somewhat close to the national level, I just want to draw your attention to is Boston. You may be wondering, why would uh, Boston, why would people buy second homes in Boston? Now keep in mind, when we say Boston, we mean Boston CSA. And the Boston CSA uh, also includes uh, Cape Cod. Okay, and we know there's a lot of uh, second home purchases in, uh, in Cape Cod, and that falls under Boston CSA. So that, that could be part of the reason here. Okay, now someone asked about investor homes. So let's go to investor homes. Very interesting, again, Investor homes are homes where, uh, are, where people are actually buying a property, not for the purpose of living there, but for the purpose of renting it out. Okay, so it's like I'm taking out a mortgage, buying a house, and I'm going to rent it out. Okay? And by the way, it doesn't have to be a person, it can be a corporation. And in fact, if you've been reading the news, um, you will actually, uh, in fact, I have this Wall Street Journal article here. Uh, this is just from a few weeks ago. Uh, Blackstone bet six billion on buying and renting homes. Blackstone just uh, uh, agreed to buy a company that buys and rents single family homes in the $6 billion deal. This is June 22nd, okay? So, and you have, uh, there is the increasing corporate uh, institutional interest in buying homes en masse and renting them out. And people are starting to see this increasingly as a, as a business model that is going to take more root as, uh, you know, uh, as a way of easing people into homes. So there are many people who want to buy houses but may not have the means to buy a house, but they may be able to rent a house with the option to own it at a future date. And that's the business model that some of these uh, institutional investors are working on. And so what you see here is a lot, lot of investor home activity in uh, set metros. Interestingly, Salt Lake City uh, stands out and they, uh, something that I hadn't really uh, uh, realized. Salt Lake City, Dallas, Dallas doesn't surprise me. Uh, and some of the others, uh, Houston, LA, Sacramento. Okay, so this is, um, this is where you have investor home uh, activity as well. Um, the last couple of points, uh, not particularly interesting. Uh, this is average loan amount. You know, San Francisco was the highest, uh, no surprise. I'm sure it's, that's a yawn. Uh, LA is the second highest. And by the way, this is uh, just uh, only includes what are called conforming loans, loans that can be underwritten by Freddie or Fannie. And anything above that is jumbo mortgages. And you know, a lot of jumbo mortgages are done in, in these high uh, uh, home price areas. So, uh, uh, and the last one is, uh, where do you see people take out more of uh, uh, shorter maturity loans, like 15 year or shorter maturity? And uh, generally keep in mind, uh, shorter maturity, if, like if I uh, take out a 15 year mortgage, typically means I can also, I have the ability, I can also take out a 30 year mortgage, but I'm choosing to take out a 15 year mortgage. Um, and means I'm willing to make the higher monthly payment. So people are, a 15-year mortgage involves a higher monthly payment because you have to pay off the loan in a shorter period of time. Um, and people are more able to do that typically places where house prices are lower. And so that's what you see here. So 
you know, Chicago, Dallas, Detroit, Houston, etc. So let me stop here and, uh, and see if there are, uh, I think, uh, oh, actually, let me just, uh, uh, there's a final uh, slide here and maybe I'll just uh, stop with that. And so summary slide. Uh, I think uh, just to summarize, a uh, large number of borrowers is at 95 LTV, 6.3%. Uh, greater than 95 with significant variation across the metros. Underwriting seems to have limited the risk layering to some extent. Um, New York City and San Francisco highest mix of first time home buyers. Florida metros have the highest mix of second home buyers, uh, but you also see a high mix in Phoenix and Sacramento. Um, and then uh, investor interest buy, inter, uh, investor buyer interest in certain metros may be driven by moves, uh, recent moves from large institutional investors. The one, uh, 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 you know, project or uh, one uh, effort worthy of uh, pursuing here is tracking these over time, um, which is something I haven't done, but uh, the data is clearly there um, that, uh, you know, like what, what did we have, what did we see before 2020? What are we seeing during 2020? And what are we seeing in 2021? We're seeing more first first time home buyers. We're seeing more invested homes, uh, more risk clearing. What you saw, what I showed you, was more of a snapshot, but cross sectional variation across metros. We can also uh, there's it's also worthy to look at time series variation. Okay, let me stop with that and uh, see if there are uh, questions. Yeah, there are quite a few questions. So Umesh asks. Uh, uh, the risk layering loans are the most riskiest loans, are they? Generally, yes. Um, they are the, now I have, it's, you know, I've defined it in this case, it depends on how you define risk layering. I've defined it as, you know, FICO less than 680 and LTV greater than 95. Uh, you can add, add other risk attributes also to it. Um, like, uh, for example, I, I haven't put a debt to income um, uh, you know, limit, you can put, uh, uh, you know, uh, there are other risk factors as well, one can add. But yes, the, the short answer is yes. And risk layering, literally, it means that you're layering risks one on top of the other. Okay. And so the more you layer, the riskier the loan becomes. And that's something that underwriters watch out for. And frankly, that is one of the lessons we learned from the crash of 2008, um, that uh, there was a lot of risk layering that happened without uh, adequate consideration to uh, to the risks uh, and how those risks are going to play out. Got it. And uh, a viewer from YouTube asks, uh, is it possible to find data about maintenance costs and development costs for a specific building? Do you know it? I don't know the answer to okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of specific. And uh, Another, uh, Daniel asks, um, what does the percentage of first home plus second home plus investment home add up to? Like, uh, are all the rest third homes or just unknown and classified? It's in the chat. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> uh, what percentage is, uh, I mean, you, you, you can add them up. I don't know that. Uh, first home and second home mean different things. Um, first home is not, first home simply means, um, yes, uh, by the way, someone's asking about GitHub. Yes, uh, the, it's, it's on the slide, the GitHub. So uh, uh, people can uh, definitely go and look at the code. Um, so just going back, uh, first home literally means first time buyer. Okay, that's, that's what a first home means. Uh, second home is someone who has a home and is buying a second home. Okay. Um, so the, the two, two measure different things. Um, investor means someone who's buying a home for the purpose of uh, renting it out. It could be their first home. Um, uh, you know, they may be living in an apartment and buying, a, uh, buying an investor property. So, or it could be a second home too. So these, these are three different uh, quantities. So I'm not sure it necessarily makes sense to add them all up unless you have a specific uh, uh, specific uh, objective or specific theory in mind. Okay? 
Uh, I think there was more to that question. Uh, I can, uh, yeah. Uh, are the, all the rest third plus homes just unknown classified? Well, um, the data doesn't uh, uh, distinguish between second homes and third homes. So like if someone is already owning a, uh, two homes and they're buying a third property, is that considered a third home? The data is not distinguishing that. Okay, my guess is it probably just shows up as a second home. Okay, um, sorry, the question is, um, are there more categories for loans or just these three categories? Um, there actually are more categories. And if you're interested, again, I would uh, refer you to the Freddie Mac uh, uh, website. Here is the Freddie Mac uh, website, single, uh, uh, you know, you can go there, there's a user guide. Uh, there's lots of detail on the attributes. Okay. Um, okay. So, Elena Pavlov, where is the risk reduction coming in? Risk claim when multiplying is not the same. Yeah. So, yes, that actually, Elena, that's exactly the point. So, in other words, if I go less than 680, uh, if I can go back, um, if I go less than 680, uh, and let's just work at the national level. Okay, nationally that number is four point six percent. Okay, and uh, the uh, LTV uh, greater than uh, or equal to ninety five. Um, that is uh, that is roughly thirty percent. Okay, so if somebody was underwriting mortgages without considering the interrelationship between the two, then the the mix of uh, the percentage of FICO less than 680 and LTD greater than equal to 95 should be the product of 4.6 and 30%. Okay, if you did the, do the math, 4.6 times 30% is 1.38%. But what we actually see is 1.2%. And that is the point I was trying to make that the underwriters are actually coming in and restricting the population of borrowers who have both uh, low FICO and a high LTV. And that's what, uh, and you see that at the national level, you also see it at uh, the Metro level, but what you see is different is variation across metros in how that uh, underwriting applies. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm sure I missed some other questions. So let me go up. Um, uh, Umesh asks, uh, do you think large institutional investors are pricing our first time buyers out of the market? Uh, very good question. Very, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. Yeah, but it's pretty it's, specific. It's, it's an excellent question. Uh, but they're definitely after the demand. Let's just say that, okay? So the demand is coming not just from um, home buyers, uh, people who are looking to buy homes, but the demand is also coming from, it's not just Blackstone. You know, there are, uh, there's a company called Invitation Homes, in fact, which, which used to be owned by Blackstone. Blackstone, uh, uh, you know, owned in this, uh, Invitation Homes. They sold it, they made a good profit, and then they put their money back in this business. Because it's uh, and it's uh, they're not the only company. In fact, uh, uh, which are the other ones? Yeah, J.P. Morgan Asset Management, Rock Point Group, uh, Canadian Property Giant, Brookfield Asset Management. So the, uh, a lot of institutional investors are getting into this business of buying homes and renting them out. So uh, so it's uh, it's an excellent question. Okay. In the Q&A session, there's Alan asking, how far back to Freddie and Fanny's data sets go? Do you know that? Yes, I do. In fact, I think they go back to 1999 or 2000. So mm -hmm. far, far enough. So I, I think it should be, should be adequate, yes. Uh, right. it's, it's in the user guide, you know. But I, I believe it's uh, either 1999 or 2000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's joking, saying far enough for 2008. Okay. Right. <laughs> There's another question from JP asking if a buyer buys a home, then sells it, 
then buys another home. Does that qualify as a second home when they no longer own the first one in the data? No, it's um, the, if you're, if it is a home that you're buying a second, then it would qualify as your first home. Okay, so let, let me clarify. Okay, so I bought a, I buy my first home. Okay, then I sell it. And then I, I, I decide to buy a bigger home. Okay, I, so, so I sell my starter home and then I buy a bigger home. The second home that I buy is no longer a first, uh, first home. Okay, but that's, it's not a second home. A second home is when you already own a first home and you're buying a second home. So you're owning two properties at the same time. That's the second home. Okay. The uh, so that's that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, uh, distinction. Hopefully that clarifies. Second home is additional home. There you go. Uh, and then um, Fanny Make indicates that only natural persons can borrow using Fanny Make. It doesn't preclude other mortgage sources. Okay. Uh, have you looked at risk trends from 2000 to present? I have not. Again, okay. uh, I think I mentioned earlier, this was, this is a class project. We had less than yes. a week to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did what I could, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's really, uh, I, I think it's well worth the exercise. I, I, even if one doesn't go back that far, even just going back to the last few years, uh, and just get, helping un understand like what is happening in the mortgage market because we're seeing a lot of um, you know rapid change in the mortgage market. Um, and even though Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae data is not the most current, uh, Freddie Mac, as I said, is up to third quarter. They actually just released their fourth, fourth quarter data, but it uh, it came after the project was done. Fannie Mae also has their fourth quarter data, so you can get data through the end of 2020. Um, but just still, because of the fact it's loan level and there's so much data and detail here, and you can still at a metro level, you can group the data geographically. There's, there's a lot of inferences one can draw from this data. So it's uh, a time series uh, um, you know, analysis is definitely well worth it uh, in my opinion. Wow, there are lots of, in the chat, any given by definition, buyer prices out other buyers by creating more demand, which raises prices in case of the wholesale institutional buyers, the effect of pricing out only increases. Wow, I'm like learning new stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's just more demand. I think that that's fair to yes. say. It's not just people who are looking to buy homes for the purpose of living in it or even for so yeah. You're having the institutional investors coming and buying homes to convert them into rental properties, rental homes. And this is to ease potential future home buyers into properties today. Uh, it's, it's a new business model that's taking shape. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Mm. Questions, comments? I'm just scrolling through the, the <laughs> chat. Uh, I don't know if, 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 if there's any question I have not uh, uh, answered, please, uh, uh, please uh, uh, just uh, let me know that. Um, yeah, they are all like um, leaving good comments about your projects. <laughs> Thank you. That is so great of you guys. Yeah, and I, I saw that there was a, a, a question about, uh, uh, you know, the code and uh, the codes. Uh, I'll, uh, I, do we, we make the presentation uh, available, right, Martina? Uh, yes, uh, okay. after the, the, like, the, present, the presentation, I'm going to okay. send you out all the notes, slides, and the recording. So if you guys want, you can... Uh, DM us your email or you can just email us at 
admissions at nycdatascience.com. I'll write it in the chat. Science.com. <laughs> oh, there's a question. Did you use R and local web server for your visualizations? Uh, yes. Uh, R and what, what uh, local web server? Yes. I, I just am visualizing it on my machine, if that's the question. Yes. Yeah. So basically, this was a second project uh, yes. out of the four that our book and students have to do. So it like he had only one week to prepare this presentation. So it's like really interesting. And uh, he started learning data science 11 weeks ago, right? That is correct. <laughs> yes. that, that is and correct. now he can do like lots of stuff. And I think next week he's gonna finish his bootcamp. So he's gonna have another project, the capstone one, right? That is correct. Yes. And uh, just in case you guys are interested in our book camps in general, uh, next Tuesday, so July 20th, around 4 p.m. New York time, we're going to have a, an open house and we're going to invite two alumni that um, joined our book camp and uh, graduated and now are working in some tech companies, if you guys are interested. So um, follow our social media accounts so that you guys are. Uh, have the latest news about our events and uh, yeah, we have more coming up. But yeah, you guys have questions in general for Sharad or our book comes? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, no. So if, if you have any further questions, I guess, uh, uh, you know, how does it work if they have follow-up questions, do they contact you? Uh, Yes, uh, okay. if you have questions, you can also like just email me and I can forward the questions to Shara if uh, they are like really specific. <laughs> so is this project from Data Science Bootcamp or Data yeah. Business Analysis? The Data Science Bootcamp. Yeah, I just- I believe um, that uh, Shara is in our remote live. So mm -hmm. he's actually, uh, studying nine to five with our professors, uh, like on live. Yes. And uh, also our interactive distance learning. So it's a bootcamp that you learn at your own pace. So we have recorded videos, but if you have questions, um, you can just ask the professors. They're always on Slack. <laughs> can you write your full name in the chat so that we can link in you? I'm never going to be able to talk. <laughs> Are you, yeah, would you like to add people? Yeah. Ooh, I think you, yes. I sent it in the chat if you guys want to connect with uh, Shara. He, he's really like cool. I read his biography and like, he has lots of professional experience in the financial industry, so. Good job. Oh, there's a question here from Daniel saying, Dr. Sharat mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, something about not using data from the source and derive it independently. Can you expound on that rule of thumb a bit more? What specifically does it mean? Yeah, so this is a, <laughs> yeah, generally, we want to see, so, uh, so let me clarify this. So Freddie Mac gets the borrower's data. So the borrower, when they close on a mortgage, they provide the address of the property. That's the data that comes to Freddie Mac. And the MSA in which the borrower is, is a derived feed. Okay, the borrower or, you know, because if I know the, zip code of the borrower, I can derive the MSA. So normally I would just use the zip code because that's like the primary data. That's not the derived data. I don't want to use a derived data from a source. I would rather derive the data independently. I would just use the data that that source is 
that source owns, like Freddie Mac owns the borrowers. They don't own the MSA because the MSA is a, is a derived fee. But in this case, I actually uh, I used the MSA because Freddie Mac had uh, limited the zip code to three digits. So they had reduced the information in the zip code. And um, the, uh, but in calculating the MSA, in determining the MSA, they, they, Freddie Mac knows the full five digit. So for me, the MSA actually had information that I could not have gotten elsewhere. That's why I used both sources of information. Okay, mm -hmm. so that 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 is the point here. That uh, yeah, as as data scientists, we all we always want to use uh, like data from the source. We don't want to use derived data unless we can verify that the derived data is uh, you know has been derived uh, uh, you know accurately and so on. Hopefully, that answers the question. I think somebody asked, what, what does my name mean? Uh, I'll just... Um... <laughs> okay, that's the meaning of my name. It means autumn moon. Shara Chandra oh, wow. means autumn moon. Oh. Wow. Uh, is this a zip code or borrower or zip code? It's a property. Yeah. Um, property zip code. Got it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Property zip code. <laughs> okay. Um, there was any sense when you were there that the bubble was approaching? No comment. Hmm. <laughs> no comment. Okay. Yeah, really interesting though. Wow. Yeah. By the way, it's not uh, the day. It's not ninety-eight. You mean two thousand eight? But 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 I know what you mean. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you guys have other questions, or you want to leave your email in the chat? I was there in ninety-eight too. Yes. Yeah. So, well, good job of looking up my <laughs> resume. <laughs> wow. Um, but the, but you're right. I was there in ninety-eight, and then I I, I came back. Yeah. That's, that's true. So cool. <laughs> yeah, smiley face. It's the power of social media. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. You guys have other questions or things you would like to ask? Shut up. Mm, if not, I'm going to close the room in five minutes and uh, yeah, if you want the notes, slides, and the recording, uh, just uh, email us or um, yeah, leave the, your email in the chat. And uh, if you want to know more about our bootcamp, we're going to have the open house next Tuesday. So um, follow our social media. Yeah. Questions? Got it. Bye, JP. <laughs> All right, great job. I learned a lot. Yes, me too. It Thank was you. really interesting. Thank you. Wow. Let me stop sharing. Mm -hmm. You made me yeah. relive the anxiety of the house purchase. <laughs> 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 uh, Mm, if there are no more questions, I'm just gonna close the room. Or you guys want to wait a little bit? I have uh, Elena sent her email as well. Okay, put it down. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I think we're good yeah. to go. Thank you so much, Shara. It right. was really interesting. Thank, thank you, Marjana. Thank you, Nori. Mm -hmm. And good luck with your capstone project. Thank you. I, I need that. <laughs> I'm excited for that one. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you Martina, then. Yana sent an email as well. Yes. Uh, I got that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye, okay. Bye. Bye, guys. Nice meeting you all.